we're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, thank you again, everyone, for attending. It's my name is Peggy Nolte. I'm actually a program manager here at the University of Arizona, and I'm currently serving as your Consortium of Neurology Education Coordinators um, Chair. Um, we've come through, I think, sort of surviving our first year. It's been interesting, a little bumpy, trying to fill our way around being a new consortium at the um, with the AAN and. Um, we thank you for being patient with us as Chris and I um, sort of got our feet wet and um, I think we're building momentum. So um, if Chris, if you'd want to just introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Chris Berry. I am at Duke and um, I, as Peggy said, I'm the chair elect for our consortium and we're just thrilled that we have so many people on. With us today, it looks like there's at least 53 people. So that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, so welcome everyone. Yes, and we could not do our jobs or even be effective here um, through the consortium without some incredible people at the American Academy of Neurology. So um, if Lucy, if you want to start and introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, Peggy. I appreciate that. I'm uh, Lucy Persaud. I am the Associate Director for Trainee Education at the Academy. And as Peggy Steph, the staff liaison for this consortium, along with the resident fellow and the program director consortium. So we're excited to have this consortium in place for to provide you folks with the resources that you need. Allison? Yes, I am Allison. I'm the graduate education coordinator here at the AAN. And so I work directly with Lucy and Peggy and Chris. And we also have Alyssa here. Hello, I'm Alyssa Barthel, meetings and events coordinator for AAN, just assisting with meeting logistics today. Great. Thank you, everyone. If you have questions, you know, you know how to find all of us. I'm always welcoming. Um, Lucy and Allison hold our hands through whatever's needed at the AA end, and um, it's so appreciative to have their support with us. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Peggy. <clears throat> um, I'm so excited that um, Dr. Carrie Adair is with us today. Carrie did a presentation for um, program coordinators in let's see, I guess it was in February at our annual workshop and it was on mindfulness and burnout and well-being. And um, I asked her quickly after that whether or not she would be willing to present to our group because everything that she talked about that day I thought was really um, good for all coordinators, clerkship and fellowship and residency. So um, Dr. Adair is a social, social psychologist who specializes in healthcare, worker burnout and well-being. And her research examines psychology of burnout and resilience, interpersonal relationships, mindfulness, tools to enhance resilience and improving safety culture. So without further ado, Dr. Adair. Thanks so much, Chris, Peggy, everyone. It is so nice to meet you all. I'm so excited to be with you today. This is great. Um, hopefully, am I sharing my screen? Does everything look good? Excellent. All right, so I'm going to take us on a really quick tour of a lot of our research, a lot of our tools, um, and some of the most um, popular topics right now because, oh my goodness, what a year this has been. This topic of well-being um, is so important now. Um, so I'm so glad that this is being highlighted in this meeting. Um, and I got to learn about, um, you know, a little bit of what the role of the coordinators is at, because I really didn't know, but oh my goodness, having to keep your fingers in lots of different buckets and tracking so many different fellows and programs. And it, I'm just, very impressed with um, all of the things that need to happen. And I imagine that that became 10 times harder when we became virtual. So um, hopefully this is interesting and relevant. Um, and I am going to be using the chat box today. So if you um, are able to open your chat box window, um, we are gonna be using that during the session. 
Um, I'm going to be asking you to type a few things in, all voluntary, but hopefully you're, you're up to it. Um, and I'm also going to be asking you to engage in some brief activities. So um, this should be fun and interactive. And if you have questions along the way or any issues, um, pop that in the chat. We're also going to save about five minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so we'll go to about 1.45 central time um, to, to get to that Q&A at the end. All right, without further ado, we have been spending the last five years working on a large R01 NIH grant specifically to reduce healthcare worker burnout. So yes, I work specifically in healthcare, but truly all of our tools, all of the psychology of well-being really applies to everyone. Um, and in fact, our tools can be used by anyone. Um, and here are just some of the really popular ones right now. And I'm going to be speaking to a couple of these in more detail today. So if you don't get exactly what you were interested in, in the topics in the talk, just know there's a huge buffet out there um, and you could pick among um, some of the other topics that might interest you. So when it comes to the psychology of well-being, we have an uphill battle as humans because we are actually wired to focus on the negative, to focus on threats and stressors in our environment. And it's really adaptive, actually, because it means we stay alive, right? You know, our ancestors ran away from the, the, the wild boar, the, the wildebeest, anything that was coming at us. We could focus on that negative threat and, you know, escape it. But unfortunately, this has created a bias where we're so much more likely to focus on and think about and think again and again and again about the negative, right? And so much less likely to think about the positive. Um, and right now we know too that it's not just a one-time threat. We often have these chronic stressors, you know, i.e. COVID-19, oh my goodness, right? Talk about a long-term chronic stressor. So we have to push against or at least try to overcome this bias. Um, we love this quote by Dr. Fredrickson, the negative screams at you, but the positive only whispers. So what we need to do is really amplify those whispers because we're hardwired to remember the negative and positive emotions, while we love them, we tend to seek them out and enjoy them, they actually slide off our brain like Teflon. So that gives us a pretty clear direction for where we need to go. Uh, and I love this cartoon, it pretty much sums it up. The heart is saying, brain, look, look at all these good things. And the brain is focused saying, not now, can't you see I'm busy focusing on that one bad thing, right? That is it in a nutshell. But the good news is that actually positive emotions, it's not about having these Instagram worthy, incredible life-changing days. It's about the frequency, not the magnitude of positive emotions for our well-being that really matters. So if you're just getting, you know, relatively uplifting moments um, at a regular interval, that's what really matters. You don't have to have these really big positive emotions um, to make a difference. So those everyday doses of joy and meaning, even the little things. And I love this quote, enjoy the little things in life because one day you'll look back and realize those were actually the big things. And that's what the data you know, really suggests for our well-being. So I want us to now uh, take a look at the screen. And this is going to be one of those chat box moments. So pull up that chat box. And I'm hoping um, that you can use that chat box to identify anything unusual you might see in this lung scan. All right, what do you see? Anything weird in there? Jillian says, Bigfoot, gorilla, yeah. Anyone else see it too? Nice. All right, well done, folks. Dun, da, da, da. Godzilla, nice, there we go, there he is. So if you didn't see the gorilla in the upper right-hand portion of this image, don't worry, because actually radiologists in one study, there were 83% didn't notice the gorilla in this image. Oh my goodness, should we, we be worried? Well, it turns out radiologists, when they look at a lung scan like this, they're going white nodes, white nodes, white nodes. That's what they're scanning for. And so they failed to see this dark anomaly 
in this lung scan because that's not what they were looking for. And in the same way, when we are really overwhelmed and stressed, humans scan their environment for the next threat, the next big thing, right? So think about a time, um, you know, we've all had these moments where we've uh, misinterpreted an email or a text message. I know I have, right? And it's always in the negative direction. Like, I can't believe you would assume that, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it's usually when we're stressed, right? We're overwhelmed. Um, and we're just kind of scanning our environment at the ready to perceive things as being more stressful. Um, and so again, we have to overcome this bias um, that we have. And we do know, you know, lots of research shows that burnout, not surprisingly, is bad for us. It's associated with shorter lifespan, lower quality relationships, decreased immune system functioning, personal injury, traffic violations and accidents, problems with work-life balance, depression, PTSD, and suicide. And of course, burnout, you know, low well-being is associated with lower work outcomes, right? We're not doing our best work. In the healthcare setting, this is associated with lower patient satisfaction, higher rates of hospital acquired infections, higher rates of medication errors, and higher st standardized mortality ratios. So when it comes to recharging our batteries, the research shows that it comes down to these two things, finding purpose and meaning and positive emotions. And the good news, more good news, is that there's actually a pretty diverse array of positive emotions that we can draw upon. Um, there's actually a bias that uh, we tend to say, oh, I wanna be happy. This idea of just being happy, um, all encompassing all of our positive emotions. But when we can get more specific, we find more opportunities to really savor um, each type of positive experience. Um, and that's what fills our tank. That's what recharges our batteries. Um, and so that's at the core of our tools is finding meaning, finding positive emotions and um, overcoming that um, brain fixation on the negative when we are stressed. Because when we're stressed, like the radiologists, we focus on the negative and we actually fail to even see the positive that is around us. So how can we amplify that? Well, the first uh, aspect I wanna focus on is gratitude because gratitude is this really powerful emotion for our well-being. Um, unlike other positive emotions, it seems to be the fastest way that we can shift from one of those really overwhelmed, frustrated, uh, stressed out mindsets to one that is you know, appreciating the good things or the good people that are in our environment. So it, it shifts from a, a sense of lack, a sense of frustration to a sense of appreciation. Um, and it's pretty, pretty darn powerful. Um, and we've published this, I'll, I'll share with you some of that. In our tool, we focus on gratitude towards other people. Now we can also focus on gratitude for um, you know, good, other good things in our lives. But um, in the tool specifically that we've researched, it is a gratitude letter prompt. And I would like for you, we're gonna do another chat box uh, activity. I'm gonna read through the instructions for the gratitude letter tool. But if you would, you have a little choice here. If you would just put into the chat, if you would like, um, please mention either something you're grateful for or someone you're grateful for and why you have that sense of gratitude. All right, it's kind of fun to, to share and read these from other people. So go ahead and put that in the chat box. In our um, uh, tool instructions, we ask folks to simply think of someone who's done something amazing for you. This person can be alive or no longer with us. This person contributed to your well being in a, in a big way. Spend the next few minutes writing a brief note telling this person what they did, how it impacted you, and what this says about them. Be genuine, kind, and appreciative in your note. So hopefully this is um, something that resonates because we all have had folks who've you know, either gone out of their way for us or made just a really powerful impact. They were a role, mo role model. Um, you know, we have lots of uh, things even despite a global pandemic to be appreciative for. And in fact, 
there are things maybe that have come out of this year, uh, opportunities or a different way of living that has actually boosted our well-being uh, in a particular domain. So that's always um, something to consider as well. Oh, seeing lots of great stuff in the chat. Grateful for family, sunny day and warmer weather. I love it to be employed. Absolutely. Family. This is awesome. 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 Good. I'm hoping y'all can, can go through those. I won't read all of them, but um, it's just so, it's so nice not only to, to reflect on our own gratitude, but to sort of um, savor other people's um, gratitude as well. So here is our uh, publication. Um, this was in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, and we found participants in this tool uh, reported uh, benefits or increases in uh, happiness and poor work-life balance, and um, in, in terms of their work-life balance got better, and they uh, decrease in their emotional exhaustion. Um, and that was from baseline to one week post. In another paper, we found that this effect lasts at least a month. So one month after writing a five to seven minute long gratitude letter, these participants were reporting significant uh, benefits for their well-being, for burnout, happiness, and work-life balance. So pretty cool, uh, especially for something so brief. Um, and we can bring these ideas into the workplace. So I'll highlight the work at Duke Raleigh. They've done amazing uh, interventions with their staff or, or um, these kinds of experiences. They did candy grams where everyone could stop by at the table, write a quick note to a colleague that they wanted to you know, celebrate, uh, send that, that note to, and you know, they get a little bit of candy along the way. I guess they ran out of at all of it pretty quickly because everyone really enjoyed um, doing this. You can also do gratitude walls. Um, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Put up some butcher paper. I know there are virtual ways of doing this too. Different websites that you know serve the same function, so that's awesome. Um, but people get really creative about sort of spreading and sharing the gratitude. So that's uh, pretty pretty darn cool. We love um, to hear those stories that are that are pretty powerful. So if you want to try our um, online tool, this is the link. So it's bit.ly forward slash grat tool. Um, you just put that in a browser. You don't Google it, just put it right in that address bar. Um, and you'll take a quick survey, you'll write a quick letter, and then you'll get some follow-up surveys because we wanna check in and see how this tool went for you. Um, so that is the gratitude letter tool. And I'll have these links up at the end also. All right, the next topic I wanna um, focus on uh, I'm going to introduce with Dr. Christopher Peterson. Um, he was this incredible researcher in psychology, um, and he, he found, actually, that across all of this research that he and his colleagues did, that he could basically sum up your resilience, for your resilience, three words, a three-word summary. Other people matter. Other people matter. They can lift you up, and they can tear you down. Right, And we know that because of that negativity bias, that the people who tear you down are going to take a lot of your focus, a lot of your energy, right? Um, but can we focus on and you know, be more deliberate about spending time with those who lift us up, right? Making sure that we are you know, getting the social connection, the support, those connections um, that, that we need because we are a very social species. And that's part of why this pandemic has been so hard because those routines around connection were really interrupted. So I wanna just put out there some safe social connection um, advice based on the research. I won't go into detail on all of these and I'm sure you're either doing some of these or you've heard of them. Um, but one of the biggest misconceptions about social connection is that other people don't want to hear from us. And there's actually lots of research showing that everyone has this misconception and it's false, right? That when we actually reach out to others, they are delighted um, in very large part, I think it's like 96%, um, delighted to hear from us. Those conversations go so much better than we expect. Um, and so just assuming that reaching out will have a positive effect, um, you're so much more likely to actually go ahead and do it. Um, I'll also mention social media. The research shows, and there's really good longitudinal studies, the longer we spend on social media, the more sour our mood becomes and the more depressed we feel. 
And so we know though, that if we are more active or interacting positively with people that we know, um, that can be beneficial. So really reducing that passive scrolling, that's where we seem to get that sour mood. We start um, you know, comparing ourselves like, oh God, her life seems perfect. Why is my life not like that? You know, all of those kinds of um, inevitable uh, aspects of social media on top of, you know, all the negativity that's out there, just being more aware of how we're using social media. Um, and then I know there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. So if you're experiencing that, no need to do video chat. But the research suggests that the more um, sort of channels or information from that other person that you can get, so, you know, um, facial expressions, actually vocal expressions convey a lot of information. Um, those are better in terms of feeling connected with others, um, but any connection is better than none. So if you're just able to text, shoot a quick text off to a friend or family member, that's great too. So again, we need to notice when it's happening, social connection, and make it happen. And I know that for many folks, right when the pandemic started, there was a kind of a boost of energy to uh, get more of this, you know, Skype happy hours, if you will, et cetera. Um, and that kind of tapered off for most folks. So making sure that you're getting um, you know, a good dose of social connection, keeping in mind that it is so central to our well being. So we also recommend folks making this a part of a meeting agenda. And we like to do this by saying, OK, everyone, five minutes. Let's go right around. What's one good thing so far this week that's going on for you? Personal, professional? What, is, what do you got going on? What's good? Um, and this tends to have a pretty big impact on the tone of that meeting, helps people feel more connected to their colleagues. Um, it improves teamwork. So this is a really quick um, and easy way to boost that positivity in the meeting. Uh, but a couple other ideas I'll put up here. Um, celebrate wins, those, that's a biggie, um, research showing that. Also checking in with someone showing, going through a tough time to give support. Um, actually research shows that getting support is good for us, but giving support to other people is even better for us. And we have control over when we give support to other people. So that's kind of a, um, a really powerful way to enhance our well being. Um, they think that this is what is behind um, the benefits of volunteering. Um, and there are quite a bit of, of benefits for that. So again, I'll share with you some awesome work. Um, this was pre COVID, uh, but this is out of Duke Raleigh where they volunteer, they did have a ha Habitat for Humanity, food drives. Um, they would have these really silly uh, themed meetings, as you can see in that bottom picture, um, but all ways to boost social connection, boost um, this aspect of kind of giving back um, to the community. We have a tool for social connection. Um, and the idea here is to reflect on good chats. Like in, instead of focusing on the tough chats that we have, right, when we're driving home, we're thinking, oh, I should have said this to him. Um, instead, thinking about um, those moments where we felt uplifted or connected with other people. Um, and so this is about eight days of reflection. Um, and again, you'll get some follow-ups, uh, but this is a really powerful tool, really popular. Um, you can feel free to check that one out too. All right, so we're gonna turn now to our last topic and we're gonna focus a little bit more on this one than the other topics. And this is all about the relationship that we have um, with ourselves. Um, what is the tone of that voice in our heads? What is that voice saying to us? And especially when we are going through a hard time or maybe we made a mistake, maybe we're just really struggling with something in our environment, how are we talking to ourselves? Are we being really critical? Are we being kinder to ourselves? Well, for most folk, folks, they're so much harder on themselves than they are on other people, right? We might even say things to ourselves that we would never say to another person. Um, and there's some pretty important consequences of this. I don't think many of us really think about that voice. We just kind of take it for granted. But actually, as if we were hearing it from outside of us, it has impacts on our physiology, 
of course, on our psychology, on our behavior. Um, and I'm going to be getting into aspects of that um, in just a little bit. But I'll also put out there that this notion of, you know, that voice in our head, that, that the way we treat each other, what we would consider a kinder voice being more self-compassionate. You know, some people think of this as a little fluffy, right? Like, oh my gosh, self-compassion, how touchy-feely, how fluffy, how silly. Um, I get that, but hopefully I'm going to dispel um, any misconceptions because there is really good science on this topic. So what do I mean by self-compassion? Pretty simple. It is simply acknowledging one's own suffering and treating it with compassion. Caring for ourselves as we would care for someone we truly love. And again, we tend to be really hard on ourselves, especially compared to how we treat other people. And there are three components of self-compassion. The first is this aspect of self-kindness. This is where you're understanding yourself, um, being more understanding to yourself. You're not punishing yourself. It's that notion that I think is the most obvious for self-compassion. And really it's about simply acknowledging the reality that no one is perfect, right? We can't always get exactly what we want or that we're striving for. And when we deny that reality, um, that's when suffering really occurs. Um, in the increases our stress, our frustration, our self-criticism. Um, but if we can accept the fact that we're human, um, that's when we can start to um, allow ourselves to process what happened, um, experience more compassion, um, and just be more understanding, right? More realistic to ourselves. So I, um, I'll tell you a quick personal story related to this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk to the anesthesiology department at Johns Hopkins. And because of the surgery schedule, the talk was really early in the morning, especially for a psychologist. Um, but I got there a whole hour early to check my slides, make sure the videos were working, et cetera, make sure I didn't get lost. Um, and I was good to go. And of course, in the middle of the talk, my video clip didn't work. Has that ever happened to you, right? Oh, that's the worst, especially because, you know, I, it did before. Um, and so what was I thinking when that happened? Oh, this is terrible. I look like an idiot. I look so unprofessional, so unprepared. And I'm standing there having these thoughts and I'm paralyzed. I, I don't know what to do because I'm having these really critical thoughts. And then because I'm trying to be more self-compassionate, I had to take a breath. And I have this moment of clarity in my brain to say, let's take advantage of this moment. While I get a little AV help, let's do some impromptu Q&A. And actually that might've been the best part of the talk <laughs> um, because there were so many great questions. Um, and in fact, out of that Q&A came a collaboration um, where we actually ended up publishing about the importance of reducing burnout for patient safety. Um, and that probably never would have happened if you know I didn't have that clarity of being more self-compassionate to do some Q&A. So the second aspect of self-compassion is the sense of common humanity, connectedness. Everybody goes through this, right? When we're suffering, when we're going through a tough time and we've made a mistake, it can feel very, very isolating. You know, in that aspect, that isolation, um, that also drives shame and we can really downward spiral when we're, when we're feeling alone in, in whatever we're going through. Um, but when we can recognize that actually, you know, our experience is not in isolation, that everyone goes through tough times, um, that we have gone through tough times and, and have come out on the other side. Um, I think especially for the pandemic, you know, we can be really aware of the fact that, you know, a lot of folks are going through a tough time and it's okay. We're going to get through this. We're not alone in, in our struggles. Um, when I was in grad school, um, I realized, well, I realized now that what I was going through was um, imposter syndrome, right? I felt I looked around, I felt like everyone here is really smart. How did I get in this program? Was there a mistake? 
Um, they're going to find me out, you know? <laughs> and one day um, in the lab, it came out that all the other grad students felt this way too. And I can't tell you how powerful that moment was because I had been feeling horrible related to this. And if these other students who I really admired and you know, thought the world of, if they felt this way too, maybe, maybe there wasn't a mistake. Maybe, I, maybe it is okay that I'm in this program. So it completely shifted how I felt about um, you know, being in that, in, that, in that position. In fact, um, the word compassion actually means co-suffering or suffering with. So we can keep that in mind um, as well for the second aspect. Okay, number three. Number three is mindfulness. And this is this aspect of mindfulness where we're neither ignoring nor exaggerating our feelings of failure. Uh, I think a lot of folks, um, it's kind of a runaway train, right? We start really ruminating over, I'm a failure, this was horrible, I'm embarrassed, right? We kind of focus so much on the bad thing that we you know, miss out on the greater context. Um, and so that can really also increase our suffering. Uh, but we're also not going to push it under the sand, you know, push it away, suppress those uh, negative feelings as well. Um, so we're being really balanced and appropriate in our understanding of what happened and our emotions. So I love this shorthand. This is from the meditation teacher Shinzen Young, that suffering is the product of pain times resistance. And pain in life is inevitable, but it's that resistance piece that we have some control over. And when we're more self-compassionate, we're able to soften our resistance to our experience, to that pain. And that allows us to process it, to learn from it, and to move forward in ways that really will reduce our suffering. So I wanna pause here and just speak to mindfulness, this one important component. Um, and this is a great quote, mindfulness isn't difficult, we just need to remember to do it. Um, and that's, I think for a lot of us, you know, we just fail to remember to do it because we're so in whatever um, is going, going on with us. So let's take a moment to do a little bit of mindful breathing. Um, I hope you are game for this. I'm gonna walk us through just a three minute mindfulness of breath meditation. Um, if you're on camera, you can feel free to turn your camera off um, and you can feel free to keep it on if you'd like, um, but just go ahead and follow my instructions and see if you can find a comfortable position and it can help if your back is relatively upright, but not strained. You can place your hands on your lap or anywhere that's comfortable. You can lower your eyes or close them. And just settling in here, maybe noticing any sensations of touch where your body is touching the chair. Where your feet are making contact with your shoes. Floor. Maybe seeing if you can feel any sensation of air on your skin. Turning inward, focusing on your breath. Maybe taking one deliberate in breath, an out breath. Or you can just let your breath flow naturally. Just letting your awareness rest wherever you feel the breath the most. Noticing any sensations of breath in your nostrils or your throat, your chest or your belly. Just 
just paying attention to that sensation as you inhale and as you exhale. Even noticing the spaces between the inhale and the exhale. Space at the top of the breath and the bottom. A pause. see if there's anywhere in your body that you can soften a little bit, anywhere that needs a little extra relaxation, releasing any tension from your forehead or your jaw, your shoulders or your back, just seeing if you can soften a little bit. Taking one more deliberate breath here. Allowing your body to settle. If you're ready, you can wiggle your toes or wiggle your fingers. Gently opening your eyes. Coming back to our session. All right, how did that go? Hope you enjoyed that. Um, again, that was a, a mindfulness of breath um, and sensation meditation. And it was quick, right? Just a few minutes. Um, but most people notice a very um, apparent change when they do something like that. So I think a lot of, I think meditation is really intimidating, but just knowing that we can take three minutes and change our physiology, change how stressed we feel, just by doing some mindfulness of breath. You know, most of us can carve out three minutes, um, even if we're really stressed, and that can make a powerful difference. All right, so back to self-compassion. I'll also mention, if you fell asleep, <laughs> That's actually really common too. Um, and that just means you need sleep and you probably already knew that, right? So don't feel bad. Um, in fact, the Dalai Lama says that sleep is the best meditation. So there you go. All right, so I think most of us are aware of, you know, maybe those go-to critical thoughts that we have. What would it sound like if we were more self-compassionate in our, in our own minds? So here are some examples. This is temporary. I'm doing the best I can right now. I will get through this. Uh, I am more resilient than I feel right now. Um, it's okay to relax. That's a biggie for a lot of folks. <laughs> I will honor my physical and emotional needs. And as I mentioned, there's great research on this. Self-compassion, especially for the world that we're living in right now, self-compassion boosts the immune system, reduces anxiety, prevents the physiological stress response, is associated with less inflammation, and makes us feel less alone. Um, and further, there's uh, research showing that it brings about increases in this left column, right? Happiness, self-confidence, optimism, all of those things that most folks want, and reductions in this right column, depression, anxiety, stress, perfectionism. Um, that's a biggie for a lot of folks. Um, fear of failure, right? And what's going on here? Well, when we have that critical thought, oh, I better do this perfectly or I'll be a failure or, oh, I'm an idiot. Why should I even try anymore? It's those negative thoughts that give rise to, you know, depression, anxiety, uh, rumination. Um, and it, it, it actually makes us more likely to push away from 
um, and avoid thinking about that thing um, that, that we're thinking about. Um, and it, that therefore makes it hard to learn from it. Whereas if we have a more self-compassionate understanding voice that helps us learn from those setbacks so that we can move on from them um, more quickly, um, more able to make better changes in our lives that all give rise to that left column. In other words, self-compassion helps provide the safety that we need to turn towards and accept painful emotions so they can heal. And as I said, there are lots of misconceptions about self-compassion. Um, I will mention the number one, the number one biggest misconception that you know, we hear, and with good reason, because most of us are taught this when we are children. If I'm self-compassionate, I'm not going to be motivated to improve. I have to be hard on myself, right? I need to, need to be that way to improve. Actually, research shows that the opposite is true. And these are experiments. So they, in one condition, they induced people to be more self-compassionate versus uh, being more um, focused on self-esteem boosting, or they had other control conditions. And then they set them up to experience some failure, which is why psychologists get a bad name. <laughs> um, so like one example, they had them take a test they were doomed to fail. And it was those in the self-compassion condition who were more motivated to improve themselves after that failure, and they took more self-improvement actions. They studied more for that next test. So actually, we were all taught the opposite of what is true. Being more self-compassionate makes us more likely to succeed. Okay, so we have just a few more minutes before we'll get to q and I hope you're having some um, germinating Q&A uh, thoughts. Um, but before we turn to that, um, I'm going to guide us through one more practice. And this is a more self-compassionate focused practice. So again, feel free to turn off your video if you would like or leave it on. Um, and you're just following my instructions. And again, we're gonna find that comfortable position you know, with our back relatively upright, but relaxed. And you can close your eyes if you would like. You can rest your hands on your lap or at your sides or wherever is comfortable. And taking a few breaths here, just allowing ourselves to settle in. And now taking your hand and placing it over your heart to remind yourself to send yourself some warmth and compassion and some grace. A reminder to be kinder to yourself for what you've gone through or what you're going through. And sometimes what we're going through is being harder on ourselves than maybe we ought to. Again, focusing on that breath. Noticing any sensations of stress in the body. Perhaps in your neck or jaw or belly or forehead. And maybe notice if you're holding on to any difficult emotions like worry about the future or uneasiness about the past. Understand that every human body bears stress and worry throughout the day. And now offer yourself some grace and goodwill and understanding because of what you're holding on to in your body. In a moment, I will recite some phrases and I ask that after each phrase, in your mind, you gently repeat that phrase, sending yourself compassion as you wish yourself well. May I be safe. May I be peaceful. May I be kind to myself. 
May I accept myself as I am. If you are overwhelmed with emotion, you can just return to your breathing. You can also name the emotion or find it in the physical body and see if you can soften that in. Once again, I will recite the phrases and you can gently say them to yourself as well. May I be safe. May I be peaceful. May I be kind to myself. May I accept myself as I am. Taking a few moments now to take some deliberate breaths. Just resting in your own body. When you're ready, you can wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, gently open your eyes. All right, so that was like a loving kindness, self-compassion practice. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm gonna share our self-compassion tool. This is a two-day tool. Um, you get it via email. This is, I think, my very favorite tool because it's so powerful and only two days long. Um, so that is the link. Um, and I am going to now put up actually all of the links that we had um, earlier. There we go. Um, and if you want all of our tools, and I believe we have 19 at this point, um, you can check out the whole menu on our website, hsq.dukehealth.org forward slash tools. You can see them on the screen there. Again, really wide variety. So you kind of pick your poison, if you will, no, the opposite of poison, uh, your tonic, if you will. Um, we also do um, resilience courses and monthly webinars. So if you wanna learn more about what we have going on in the center, you can check out those links. Um, and you can also feel free to shoot me an email. Any questions, anything like that, feel free to reach out. I wanna thank you so much for having me today. And we have a couple minutes now for questions. If anyone wants to pop a question in the chat box, I would be very happy to answer it. So we will turn it over to the, the chat box and Q&A. Thanks everyone. Do you find that gratitude is generational? That is a great question. I don't know of any research on that, um, but I will say that actually there's um, a lot of research on modeling, right? We kind of learn our thought patterns, our behaviors from you know, our, 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 our parents, our grandparents, whoever, those adults that we spend a lot of time with. And so if there is a gratitude practice um, that's in place or just someone who's really expressing a lot of gratitude, that is something that would be likely to, you know, come out of you in, in, um, in your life. So again, I don't know about specific research. I don't think there's any, but I think that notion um, is very intuitive and, and makes really good sense. Thanks, I'm seeing lots of nice messages. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad the meditation was enjoyable. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be with you. I'll keep I'll keep an eye to the chat for anyone else asking a question in our last minute. I wanna thank Christine so much for inviting me. Again, it was a pleasure to share this with you. Um, and again, all of our resources, you can check them out on our website or reach out to me. Um, we are you know, a Duke Center, but we very much like to spread all of our, our tools, our, our webinars, our science, anything that we can to anyone out there, healthcare or not. Um, so please um, keep that in mind. Send the, send the link to a, to a neighbor or a friend or a family member if you think they might enjoy it. Um, the more the merrier. Well, I see one question and, I, and then we'll wrap up. I find that when exercises surrounding gratitude are conducted, people feel a bit uneasy or unfamiliar. Why do you think that is? That's a great question. Um, and I think there are a couple possibilities. One is that, um, one is th that they, um, 
they might feel like that it's either inappropriate or braggy. You know, some people think, oh, I shouldn't um, share, you know, my, my good things because I don't want them to feel bad that they don't have this good thing. Um, I think also people tend to view some of this as self-indulgent, which is really a shame. You know, I think that again is a notion that a lot of us got um, when we were children that, you know, either being uh, grateful or appreciating or, um, you know, being self-compassionate, especially it has this kind of, you shouldn't be that way. That's, that's too soft. That's too self-indulgent. Um, and, and again, that's really unfortunate because actually it's really good for you. <laughs> it's really good for you. It's really good for others. Um, so those are a couple um, aspects. I think also sometimes people feel like it's really personal um, to share uh, aspects of gratitude, or it might even feel um, a little too sensitive to themselves. Um, again, it all kind of depends. Those are just a couple of thoughts that I have um, related to, to that. That's a great question. Um, I'm going to wrap up. I will mention that my favorite meditation apps, because um, there's a question I see, um, Insight Timer, my number one, great library, free library of great meditations. Um, but some other good ones are Calm and Headspace. So definitely check those out if you're interested. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Peggy. Thank you again, everyone. It was such a pleasure to be with you today. I wish you well. Thank you, Dr. Adair. That was wonderful. We, I, I guess I could probably speak for all of us, but we don't always take time for ourselves during the day with, you know, for me with 25 residents pulling, you know, that we, you know, our days are really full. So thank you for that. Um, we are going to move on to award recognition. Um, the AAN provides us with an opportunity to show gratitude to our, our fellow coordinators. And I'm just going to briefly read here um, a description of, about this. The Program Coordinator Recognition Award is intended to acknowledge the essential function of neurology program coordinators. Program coordinators face many challenges supporting the administration of a residency program or fellowship, including uh, limited resources in both research and clinical missions that compete for time and resources with the educational mission. We recognize these neurology residency and fellowship coordinators whose creativity and innovation is crucial in ensuring the future of neurology. So um, we've put the pictures up here and I think everybody is on. Um, I'm going to um, just, we'll just read off everybody's name. Jean Peng is the fellow, residency and fellowship coordinator at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And we have Tracy White BS, who is the fellowship coordinator at Emory Brain and Health Center. Um, Samantha, I apologize if I butcher your name. Samantha Kunvagangarn, um, residency and fellowship coordinator at University of Pittsburgh Medical C Center. And last but not least, we have Melinda Scott, CMA, and Tagme. She is a residency coordinator at the University of Arkansas. So thank you very much for your hard work. And um, this nominations come from your people that your, your uh, peers around you and your faculty, and, and I'm sure your residents and fellows have nominated you. So um, Chris is going to do the clerkship awards. And you're muted. Yeah, let me unmute. <laughs> thank you. Um, Yes, I looked earlier and I did not see Cheryl or Bernadette on. If I've missed you, I apologize for that. But I just wanted to recognize Cheryl Marshall and Bernadette Clark. Cheryl is at University of Michigan and Bernadette is at Johns Hopkins. And let's see, I saw something in the chat. Okay, just wanted to make sure it wasn't one of them letting me know they were here. Anyway, um, let me just read something about this. So, um, like the residency and fellowship coordinators, our recipients were chosen for this award because they are essential to the function of neurology clerkship coordinations in coordination in medical student education. And we are recognizing how their creativity and innovation is essential to the future of neurology. And I've been a clerkship coordinator for uh, eight years and recently moved into a program coordinator role as well. And um, 
I know how essential the clerkship coordinator is to running our clerkships. And I'm blessed to work with a great team. And I hope that Cheryl and Bernadette are as well. Obviously they are because they were nominated for this award. So congratulations to both of them. Peggy, we have a few moments if anybody, any of the recipients would like to say a few words. Does anyone want to say anything? Peggy, I, um, I just wanted to say thank you to the AAN and thank you for recognizing child neurology um, since I'm a child neurology coordinator and my PD for nominating me and my best residence that I could ever have. But thank you again for all this. You are welcome. We, we all know it's such an honor to even be, I think I was nominated a couple of years ago and there's a lot of work that's been put into just the nomination. So um, thank you all. All right, Lucy, I think we'll just, we'll go ahead and move ahead. Lucy's going to talk about the GME annual meeting programming. Thanks, Peggy. I know um, you've all, most of you have seen some of this information. So if there's any questions, please feel free to um, let me know in the chat or just unmute yourselves. But just wanted to highlight some of the programming that's going to be happening um, next week during our annual meeting, starting Saturday through Thursday um, of the meeting. So um, what we what you're seeing here are the, some of the coordinated programming. We have three courses, and Peggy is doing a conversation corner during that time. It's just a time for you to engage with her to ask questions while it, while in the meeting. Next slide. This is our clerkship and program director conference. I know the content is applicable to you also, so that I wanted to provide the date and time for that. Next slide. We have a dedicated networking session for our residents and fellows at the meeting. There's There are other networking opportunities, one for students, medical students, um, which I didn't have the information just um, coming onto this, this call here. So. Um, this one I wanted to highlight. This is where um, residents and fellows can just connect. And it's nice because this, I mean, this is kind of earlier in the meeting this, on Sunday where they can, you know, kind of connect with Dr. Khan, who's the chair of our graduate education subcommittee, just to find out about, you know, what he recommends they attend. And again, from a, um, you know, perspective of, of what they're looking for as a subspecialty information, as well as just in general for the meeting, meeting content. We do have some new resident programming that is completely and brand new to the meeting schedule. And these are for the, from the perspective of what adult neurology um, residents need to know for uh, in these areas of uh, topics. So we have one for teleneurology, psychiatry, and one for child neurology. Next slide. So for our trainee and faculty networking event, this would have been our reception on Monday if we were in person, what we've done is taken a look at this and figure, and, you know, wanting to see how we could offer this virtually and what that means. So there are three key components to this. One is the department e-posters. The other one is, um, another part is four network, networking panels during the meeting. And then post-meeting, we're gonna have six networking panels since the posters will be available six months uh, after the meeting. So the next slide, Allison, this is um, information on the e-posters. I know I've sent you information on what that is. I'm working on, on the e-brochure that we will send to our trainees to let them know what posters are available from what institutions. And then also if you're able to meet with them uh, during, um, during some targeted times that we have during the panels and we have a dedicated kickoff if you're available to meet with them via Zoom or Teams or what your method of, of uh, reaching them is. So um, I'm working on that and we'll be sending that to you to confirm some of that information. And I know the Google link that I sent, some of you couldn't access just because of firewall issues. So I'm you know, trying to figure that out and working around um, just how, how, how to make sure that I have the correct information from you. Next slide. The, as I mentioned, the four networking panels that will take place during the meeting. These are our topics that we have. Um, we'll have a moderator leading these panel sessions along with um, four other faculty members in these area of, um, for these particular topics during, during the conference. So the, it'll kick off with just reminding of the e-posters and then encourage um, trainees to participate in times with uh, programs that are available following the panel. 
And as I mentioned, following the meeting, we will have, we'll have similar to the four that we have during the meeting, six um, panel sessions monthly um, from May to October. Um, we're trying to figure out what the topics will be to offer. And so it's another way for uh, trainees to have access to the posters um, to view them. Next slide. Allison, I'll let you talk about trainee trivia. Yes, so for A and Trainee Trivia, I'm sure you all are familiar with it, but we will still continue to be doing it. And they are monthly free live trivia contests using Kahoot. Um, so residents get to see different cases and accompanying questions. Um, it is open for everyone. So if you just wanted to join as well, just check it out, feel free, but it is geared more towards residents. And our next game is during the annual meeting on Wednesday, April 21st. It is on a Wednesday this time. So note the day change, usually it's on a Tuesday and the time is also a little different. So it'll be earlier in the day from six to 7 p.m. Central time. And that is the recap of the meeting information. So I'm not sure if anybody has any questions, we can take them in the chat. Otherwise I know we're kind of running a little bit behind here, Peggy. I think we'll move on. Any to other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Peggy. No, I was just going to go ahead and, and Chris is going to give a recap of the CNPD. Um, yes, I was on the CNPD meeting um, earlier in, well, let's see, it was last week, I believe. Um, and these are just some slides that were presented at the meeting. And um, I'm just gonna briefly run through them just to give you a little a snippet of what was discussed. Um, they started off with just um, a slide that shows ACGME leadership, who the office staff are, um, who the new review committee members are. Next slide. And who some of the new incoming uh, review committee neurology members are. And these are some upcoming dates for the review committees in case you were interested and some requirements that are <laughs> um, focused revisions. Um, this is just a slide that they talked about what the minimum program director time um, is for um, program directors and whether or not there's an associate program directors, but you can see based on the number of position, resident positions that you have, um, your program director is required to have <clears throat> a minimum 0.35 FTE. Um, and if you have an associate program director, then um, the total amount of time is in the right-hand column that both of those folks should have. Next slide. Um, this is just changes to um, different programs faculty qualifications and physician faculty members and non-physician faculty members um, requirements for participating in the program. Next slide. Um, this slide just talks about core faculty and that core faculty members have to have a significant role in education and supervision of residents and must devote a significant portion of their entire effort to resident education, et cetera. Uh, let's see, and this slide is related to child neurology. I won't read through all of that. Um, important role, important information for program coordinators. Um, there must be a program coordinator for all of the programs. And you can see this slide shows um, what the minimum FTE for a coordinator is based on the number of resident positions that you have in your program. So hopefully, um, your school is following those requirements. Uh, let's see, there was a task force that was set up to review um, the program requirements and they met in October and November and they made recommendations to the board of directors for any revisions. Next slide. Um, I don't remember what this discussion was about, so we'll skip that one. Uh, 
Oh, okay, I think some of these were slides we were not going to talk about today, but that's okay. Next slide. Okay, milestones. So um, the this slide just talks about what the uh, major changes were in milestones. Um, we had someone that evening ask when they might be available at their schools in MedHub. Um, I think that probably varies per schools, but I did happen to just get an email a little bit ago from our GME office and um, our milestones package is evidently going to be available in MedHub now. So I imagine you'll all hear from, uh, oh, someone says April 1st. So um, you'll probably all be hearing from your GME offices if you haven't already. Next slide. Oh, this was just a reminder on AC GME site visits, the fact that they're all still virtual. Um, so that's about it on that one. Next slide. Uh, there was a residency recruitment update. And that update talked a lot about um, statistics and um, I'm not gonna go into any of that because um, I don't know the research enough well enough for that. So this is just a slide that um, is the timeline for um, residency recruitment for 2022 in ARS. So um, this was shared on Facebook on one of the GME groups that Peggy and I are members of, probably a lot of you are as well. But anyway, in case you haven't seen that, this is the timeline for 2022 residency. Recruitment, next slide. That's it. So that was a quick and dirty little recap um, that I couldn't do too much detail about, but I just wanted to share um, some of the important things that were discussed at the meeting. Thank you. I think we have a minute. So here, so so just in case I forgot to mention, the CMPD is the Consortium of Neurology Program um, Directors, and that was um, meeting was held last week. I, I will say with regards, my big interest and part of that was recruitment is maybe during these breakout groups, we can talk about that because um, there's much talk about virtual or on-site or a blended kind of thing. And I think there's opportunity um, where on part of the spectrum is to put, to have some say or, or happy to, um, I think there's open you know, ears to hearing uh, our, our, our feeling on this and how, how we view it. And um, I think we can go ahead here and go into breakout deep groups. So we're going to, do you want to explain, Lucy, are you okay with me? Um, we're going to break into two breakout groups and um, to discuss and ask questions about topics of interest, including virtual recruitment and opportunities for engagement resources needed, all of the above. So I understand that sometimes because of budgetary um, restrictions that a lot of people might not be able to attend the conference. And this has always been the case for program coordinators, um, but we're planning on, I, I hope as many of you will be able to attend the conference, but if not, we're planning on doing monthly meetings. We wanna continue this momentum. So this is an opportunity as part of the breakout groups to share with us like what you would see or my goodness, maybe you'd be interested in in hosting one or, or, or you know, have a topic that you'd like to talk about. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to share all of these things. And I think we can go ahead um, and put us into our breakout groups. So thank you all for your input during that session. Um, as I told our group, I know many can't come to the AAN, so our, the annual meeting. So we're going to continue these. So please, please give us those suggestions. Give us, you know, what you would like to see, or if you have something that you really want, you would love to share. You know, there's such wealth in our knowledge as a group. We have, we have coordinators. I've had, I know, three calls this year from brand new coordinators, and you know, one of them in particular is with a brand new program. So. Uh, I encourage you all to share information. So I think we're on the next slide, Allison. We're right about on time here. So anyone have any new or any old business they want to share?
Well, we, does Lucy have any parting words, things that I missed? Nope, I think you covered it all, Peggy. Great. So thank you, everyone. Um, again, this will be our meeting for April. Um, we'll be back in May. And um, please, if you have the opportunity to join us at the AAN, please, please join our sessions. Um, and we'll catch up with everyone then. Chris, do you have anything else? No, I was just trying to go through my, um, through the chat. If we could not close the chat yet or not end the meeting just for a second. I'm trying to get some of the uh, uh, suggestions that folks had from my breakout room, my breakout room. So um, yeah, keep those suggestions coming for what you want us to um, share with you each month. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us. Um, Peggy, let's see. Do you have a, can we put our, can we share our email? You know what? Maybe we can share our emails in the chat. Peggy, can you enter yours and I'll enter mine? And you can also communicate through um, Lucy at the AAN and mm -hmm. or put a post on Facebook. I check the Facebook pretty regularly, just as a measure of habit. And I'm trying to be better about that for the clerkship coordinator side. Peggy's good about the program coordinator side. I did get one up for the uh, for our meeting today for the clerkship coordinator side. So, well, thank you, everyone, yep. and uh, hope to see you uh, next week at the AAN. Bye, everybody. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Bye. Bye.